Hello and welcome back. And that's right, today I want to return to the subject of the Unify Drive UT2. We did a big full depth video on a prototype model of this that was sent to us. And now that the crowdfunding has already been running for a while and we've had more time to play with this device and deal with some newer firmware updates, I wanted to do an update video on this just to give you some idea about where the project is at, what they're promising it can do, and right now what it can't do. Because so I think that's very, very important for those of you that are either back in this project and are wondering about that whether that money's in a good place or those of you that are still sitting on the fence to go for it needless to say but i think we should say it this is the unit that they have sent to me no money was changed hands this is the original prototype they sent me but with a new case more on that later on now this is hopefully the unit that you will be receiving not precisely this unit that would be mad but this is the unit that hopefully in terms of architecture and software the backers will receive but keep in mind this is crowdfunding there this isn't like traditional retail and i can only give the views that i've got right now on the unit they have sent but without further ado let's update everything we've discussed that thus far about this device with all the new testing that i've done in the meantime with the updates now it's worth highlighting that one of the main motivators behind this video was to go through the comments of the previous video and work out all the things that you guys asked about that I either didn't cover in the previous video or were not available in the previous video. I wanted to go through them one by one. So needless to say, if you go to the bottom of the screen, you will see chapters for all the things covered in this video, all the things that I've included in my follow-up tests. But the first thing a few of you raised was I didn't include an unboxing. I didn't show what was included with the device, what isn't included with the normal box of the device now i decided to sort of refilm the unboxing here to give you some idea about what was included with this kit when it was sent to me in the retail box i'll also highlight that this does include uh, a carry case there that was sent to me i'm not 100 certain whether all users will receive this or if this is going to be some sort of stretch goal there but all good stuff it looked like a nice reasonable retail kit they're way more advanced than a lot of kind of indie out there cloud copy in the sky projects which once again is kind of underlined by the fact this company seems to be aligned in some way with the uh, brand Z space, I believe, with their NAS stuff, and there's a few details on the official crowdfunding pages. Next up, that orange case. This is a stretch goal that was added to the campaign recently, and this is a, an orange uh, rubber case in exactly the same materials as that of the grey case that the default unit arrived with. I think all users are going to get this that backed it once it reached that stretch goal. Um, I will say it's nice high quality there. feels exactly the same as the lacy cases that I've used. It fits on really tightly there. It's clearly marked with all of the ports and connections. It's a nice enough case. I like it. It kind of indicates a good build quality there. Another thing I wasn't able to test in great detail in my previous video because it wasn't fully out was the dedicated desktop client. I focused a lot more on the mobile app, but I'm pleased to say that the desktop client there is pretty darn good. It gives me all of the controls that the mobile app did and even more. It's available for multiple systems. It has uh, dedicated apps that are running within that client tool there. It gives me full NAS control. I will highlight there wasn't any um, two-factor authentication, which is a bit of a bummer. I did use email verification and get a code that was only available for five minutes into my email for online access, but that wouldn't have been really helpful if I was using the device completely offline uh, and just using network only. So 2FA, MFA, a Google Authenticator and such, maybe add that support. But I will say accessing um, files and stuff via the client tool was really good using the photo application i could extract all metadata you know all of that surrounding filtered information was really really well presented the storage manager was well presented the network control was comparable to any synology or qnab i've used even included a LAN speed test tool there and the full control panel no gaps pretty much everything i would have expected to see right the way down to controlling uh, the power on even better than the mobile app so lovely stuff briefly returning to smb and mapping drives that i covered in the previous video i'll tell you right now mapping the drive um, to my local machine either utilizing the client tool or utilizing uh, local network access was a breeze i was able to mount the drive on my windows machine and access the full content to the nas on the local area network very easily and if i was utilizing the hotspot functionality of the device it allowed me to map the drive as a hotspot on my windows pc with the device in my bag if i chose to so lovely stuff 
Another quick thing is you can access the GUI via the web browser. You don't have to use a client app. You can go ahead and use a very specific domain to bounce through and relay into the system accessing it via your web browser. I wasn't able to access it via the 192.local IP, so it did seem that I still need to use the relay server to access it, but I still had to use the authentication method, that code being sent to my email there. I need a very specific login credentials in order to get into the system. So it was still good to be able to access the full control panel there via the web browser, not just be overly reliant on the mobile app or the client. Next up, that direct attach storage mode where you can attach the device uh, via USB, just like you would any USB drive rather than a NAS. I'm pleased to say that not only can you connect this device directly via USB to your Windows or Mac system, but you can still use it as a NAS simultaneously. The direct attach storage mode allows you to allocate an area of storage and that area of storage then becomes locally accessed while you can still access the device via util uh, use your all NAS means to access the rest of the system. It's a nice middle ground between the two. In terms of performance, when I did connect the device as a 50 gig DAS connected storage area, I was able to get with a 30 gig transfer around 150 to 300 megabytes per second on a Windows transfer. AJA gave me 300 to 320 megabytes per second and the allocated um, space block allowed me to not have to rely on IP protocol to access data on the system directly. It allowed me to use USB speeds, which although not full 5 gig USB, was still pretty darn good. Now I want to delve a little bit deeper into the file folder management inside this system and some of its capabilities. Number one, you can create an encrypted folder via this um, outlet and it allows you to not only create usual folders but you can create a password protected folder that's completely encrypted and you can pin that folder if needed you could even set a timer on that encryption lock so it remains open for a certain amount of time and then after that point requires password entry and after that time once again expires the encrypted folder locks it's a nice middle ground and although there is a lack of write once read many it's still a nice feature to see Next up, file folder deduplication. Now, deduplication, unlike, you know, incremental deduplication you might use for operating systems, this file folder deduplication extended to photos and videos and general file sizes. I even did a scan of lots of photos I uploaded to the system where I would have the same photo in three different versions. So, Rather than relying on the system just noticing file name similarities or file size similarities, I would have one file in a WEB p file format would have one in a png and then a reduced size png lower pixel count the system was still able to recognize photos that are exactly the same regardless of the large differences between them and then allowed me to remove them as needed next up what if you want to synchronize two of these devices together? I wanted to see what would happen with two of these, how I could transfer data between them. Now there is an intended backup center application apparently planned and I'll talk about it more late at the end of the video when I talk about the upcoming apps that they've talked about. But there is a nice file transfer system built into the device. If you have two of these, maybe one that you leave in the office and another one you take on site, you can actually set up a kind of shared drive between the two of them which creates a link and code system to individual directories that allows you via the mobile app as well to create this nice bonding upload and download from the two different devices there it's still not as streamlined as i'd like to have seen and hopefully that will be addressed in the backup center application but it's a nice way at least in the meantime to be able to share files very very quickly to other users even the code system automatically entered into the app if i had it installed Next up, AI services, and one of the ones I wanted to talk about was the OCR built into the AI Labs application. This allowed me to scan an existing database of photos and more to pull out a lot of the information you know, in terms of text, and I've got lots of text there, and I would say the success rate was mm, fair to middling. Anything that was pre-made text, I scanned a few menus and a few news articles, and it scanned the text well was pretty good, but anything to do with handwriting, and I accept my handwriting is pretty crap, it was fair to middling. It still recognized a good amount of it, so at least it was doing a fair good job, but I think there is some tweaks and optimizations down the line that could be made here. But I will say, when it came to utilizing the AI for human-related text speeches, the results were a little better. Not perfect, but still good. So once I had it enabled, obviously in the previous video we discussed using AI photo recognition, subject recognition, location recognition. Again, check out that video. But 
this allowed me to use human speech. So although I'd named myself Robbie, I could put on there, find photos of Robbie in a building, Robbie on a train, Robbie in a patterned shirt, Robbie in a fo uh, photos with four people in them. Human text searches produced results. They weren't perfect and there were issues and omissions, but on the whole, I was still pleased with this service. I will also add that all of this was happening offline. I made sure that all of the AI related features were not being conducted with internet services. It was all being managed in system, which based on that CPU, and I know it has a decent MPU, um, was still pretty impressive. Next up, and it's still a little early, I'm pleased to say that they have integrated Docker. You do need the desktop application to manage it. I wasn't able to do much of a job of that on the mobile app, but from there, I was able to create uh, individual containers for Plex, for Jellyfin, and for Portainer. Um, I did feel that it was a little unfair to gauge the performance of these, at least currently, because the system is still in development, but it was, uh, I can tell you that Plex played pretty darn well, but in terms of transcoding, it wasn't very good at all. But I don't think that's really what this machine is geared towards. Towards, but later on when the system is out of crowdfunding or at the very least uh, we've got a final RC candidate for the software then I will do proper multimedia testing on this device. Next up, system temperatures. I didn't really go into too much detail on this in the other video, and a few of you asked, so I wanted to double check, and when I did some heavy read and write performance testing on this one, we were doing both the DAS connectivity and the SMB mapped drive performance testing I mentioned earlier on, I will say that the SSDs achieved a top temperature of just 38 to 40 degrees. There, A lot of that was the fan built directly next to them, but also because they run a Gen time at uh, three times one lane and on a shared lane at that so consequently there isn't going to be huge temperatures being generated from those ssds so these numbers didn't surprise me too much i did get them a little higher when the fan was covered uh accidentally i might add but still 40 degrees not too shabby indeed and the cpu only achieved between 37 and 39 degrees but when the CPU kind of tipped into the 70-80% use, I got this up uh, to 45 to 47 degrees. And as we get towards the end of this video, a few of you wanted to know more about the inside of the system. I was a little reluctant to do this when I was uh, doing a lot of my tests for the review because, frankly, I didn't want to break this prototype. But now with a little further in the event of things, I thought I'd start taking the device apart. I'm clear, um, on the one hand, I'm pleased to confirm that the 2.5G controller is the RTL8125BG, uh, a network controller I've seen before. And as it's only one port, it's going to do the job damn well. Really good distribution there of the transistor and um, basic chip distribution um, but one thing I had mixed feelings about was that battery on the one hand it is a 2200 uh, milliamp battery there so great stuff but it wasn't easy to remove it wasn't like an old Nokia or something like that this was a battery that had been kind of held in wired and taped in place and it's not removable at all so I do wonder about the long-term use of this battery if you're running it on a power or you know, I don't think it's a bad battery per se. It seemed like a quality product, but I would have preferred to see a removable battery. Maybe that's going to be a second gen idea, but still, that's kind of a lot of you wanted to know what that battery was like, so I thought I'd feature it in the vid. And finally, closing out, a number of you wanted to talk about the apps that aren't available right now. There's a few of them. You can see them under coming he uh, coming soon headings. They're the ones that stood out for me as a security manager. Frankly, I would have liked to have seen that a lot sooner, um, but at least they're trying to integrate that in. I'm looking forward to seeing if that is just going to be antivirus like we see on Ugreen or if it's going to be a proper network security manager. Um, next up there was cloud backup options being integrated there. I wonder if that's going to be the usual suspects, your Google, your Dropbox, your OneDrive, whatever. The backup center that I've already mentioned there, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that pans out. And finally, the music portal as well. Again, going to be interested to see how much that's actually going to get used, but it's nice to see them integrating it there. Finally, connecting a USB drive or an SD um, card. I tried both on the system, and I'm pleased to say that in both occasions, the SD card was rigged, and there is multiple options for what that button on the back of the system can do. Also, when you connect a USB drive, there's similar settings, but not quite as detailed as the SD card slot, but adding a USB drive, you could set up a sync quite easily, but I do think we're gonna see more of that once the backup center application is more established and available. But there you go, this has been an update on the Unify Drive UT2. I still can't quite get over the fact that I can wave a NAS that is currently working right now in front of the camera, and I don't think I'm ever really going to get over that. We may do one more update on this, 
just before the end of the crowdfunding to give people the best possible perspective on how this campaign is doing, whether you should opt in or opt out. But overall, I'm still really, really impressed with the device. The brand has still continued to commit a lot of updates to this system. And again, we've seen several updates since that previous video and other reviewers that I've seen on the online have done similar positive reviews about this device. It is not a powerhouse system, but it is the first, at least as far as I'm concerned, the first truly portable NAS system, and I do recommend it. But without further ado, if you've got any other features or systems that you want to see, in this video about what this device is capable of or what you want to see it can and cannot do, go into the comments and let me know. That little beep, by the way, is the system running a backup on that drive now that I've inserted it. That's what I mean. Lovely and responsive. Thank you so much for watching. There's a link in the description to the full review as well from before. There's a link to the other video where you can cover all the other information and a link to the project. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.